to have that environment where people feel comfortable speaking up is is what we what we call psychological safety where people feel able to put their hands up and say hey this happened to me i made this mistake and everybody to say you know thank you for sharing off gassing a scuba podcast with host nick hogel In this episode, I sit down with Mike Mason, a human factors and diving instructor located in Australia. I first met Mike when I contacted him to enroll in the Level 1 course, a 10-week webinar series from Human Factors and Diving. Along with his work with the human diver, Mike is an active DM, a rebreather diver, and works with the Australian Air Force. I speak with Mike more about human factors in diving, his previous diving experiences, challenges going between open circuit and closed, and much more. Please enjoy. Mike, how are you doing this afternoon? I am very well, thank you, Nick. Very well indeed. Nice. How's the uh, weather over there for you today? It's been good, yeah. Probably low 30s, I guess, but no rain, a little bit of a breeze to take the edge off. I've I've been indoors doing some painting today, so I got a little bit hot and sweaty, but that's just a fact of life living in Australia. (laughs) (laughs) What uh what are you what are you painting just some some rooms inside the house? Yeah, not this house. We've got my wife and I own an investment property um just nearby and that's been just getting more and more tired over the last few years. We've get with the old tenant moved out. We need to get it ready for new tenants. So we decided to do the painting ourselves, which is oh. a bit more a good way of saving money, not having to pay a painter and decorator, but it does take time and effort. So all part of the fun. <laughs> I've uh at my house I actually just sold my house in Austin I was renting it out and um yeah we we did quite a bit of painting in there and it seems like a really good idea at first like yeah we're gonna save money this is gonna be great and then halfway through we're just kind of like yeah this is a little bit much (laughs) that sounds familiar Um, yeah but uh no man I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the podcast today I'm excited to hear about your story hear about your journey yeah, I'll just I'll jump right in. So tell me about that first breath underwater. Tell me what led you to that moment. Tell me about that whole experience. Was it love at first breath? Was it I hate this, I'm never doing this again? Tell, tell me all about it. Definitely leaning towards the former. I learned to dive back in the late 90s uh, when I was at university in the UK. And we did a, uh, a an organized trip to uh, Grenada in the Caribbean for a couple of weeks. We'd, we'd done our pool training in the UK. We went to Grenada. There was, there was a little bit of pool refresher training when we got there. And then it was straight into the ocean, just all off the beach to start with. And I will most certainly never forget that first dive, kneeling on the sand in only about, you know, whatever it was, five meters, but board shorts, just looking up at the the surface above me five meters just breathing from this regulator thinking this is all pretty cool yeah so i uh, i quite enjoyed that and that was uh, that was where it all started awesome awesome so when you after that first course how long uh like how how far did you go talk about the progression from there so at that first course was a fairly intense two-week experience it was doing the BSAC sports diver syllabus um, which qualified us down to 28 meters I think it was so kind of similar to paddy advanced open water and the the final dive of the two weeks was on a wreck called the Bianca Sea which is one of the the world's kind of better wreck dives I think really really cool and I'll never forget that experience because all the dives we'd done prior to that in Grenada were reef dives not necessarily shallow but the water was crystal clear and you could see you could see the bottom from the surface it was all quite simple whereas this dive on the bianca sea was down a shot line i'll never forget this particular moment either you know halfway down and you've just got this line just stretching off into the darkness you can't see the wreck you can't see the surface you're like this is all a little bit weird but it was really cool and then all of a sudden this shipwreck just appears out of the gloom underneath which was absolutely awesome really really good fun so that was in oh, 1999, I think. And after that, I, I have to admit, my um, my career kind of took a bit more of a front seat. Diving took a back seat. I didn't do any again for, for an awfully long time. But then when I was living in Australia the first time round in 2015, 
a friend of mine had gotten into scuba diving and he dived he showed me some pictures of the grey nurse sharks which live well there's, there's plenty of grey nurse shark sanctuaries on the australia coast on the east australia coast and he showed me the pictures of these grey nurses just not far from where i live at all and i thought that looks wicked i need to get back into scuba diving so i got a refresher course Went and saw these sharks myself, thought, this is brilliant, and never looked back. And that's about eight years ago now, I guess. So I did a lot of diving in Australia. Then I moved back to the UK in 2017, uh, North Scotland, which is not everybody's cup of tea, but the diving up there is actually pretty good, I can assure you. Um, <laughs> uh, a lot of more diving with BSAC, lots of wreck diving and things up there. Um, and then I moved back to Australia permanently a few years ago. I got my dive master qual. I, I work part-time as a dive master now. And it's, I'm just going onwards and upwards, really. I do a lot of rebreather diving. I've, I've got my Mod 1, the so normoxic trimix down to 60 meters. I'd like to do a lot more of that. I've finally got my own boat, so I can go and be a master of my own destiny a bit more and dive some more of the, the unexplored wrecks off this coast. The, the, the rest, the world is my oyster, I'm hoping. <laughs> no, awesome. Oh, man, I got ton, tons of questions just from that. Um, but I actually, I wanted Great. to ask you a little bit about... VSAC, because I I know of the organization. Obviously, I know that they're they have a little bit of higher standards. Like you were saying, the course that you took was I'm assuming that was the open water course, but it was a you're saying is like equivalent to an advanced open water with another agency. Tell me a little bit more about like BSAC in general, because I just don't really know like other than they're an agency out of Europe. I would assume, right. <laughs> No, that's fine. That, that's a fair assumption. Yep. Um, so BSAC stands for British Subaqua Club. So it's very much it's the UK, you know, does the majority of the training and diving in the UK. And it's it is what it said it is. It, it is what it says it is in that it's a club. So it's very much run by divers, for divers, distinctly non-profit. There's a BSAC kind of hierarchy or like, like a, you know, an office. I can't remember for life me where it is in the UK, but that has, you know, a chairman, a head of a head of training, a, all these sort of other people but then you've got branches all over the uk and all over the world in fact i'm i'm a member of sydney the sydney branch of bsac which is predominantly expats but there are there are branches um all over the all over the globe the good thing about bsac is because it's a club run by divers for divers it's it's not in the same vein as a lot of other training agencies where you kind of you know, you rock up, you pay some money and you're almost guaranteed to get your ticket, which I think does happen quite a bit in the dive world. It's a bit more, I would argue you have to earn it a bit more with BSAC because there's no kind of financial, uh, you know, expectation that you're going to get the certification that you've that you've applied for. So it's pretty good in that respect. And most people that do their training with BSAC do it in the UK in, you know, inland quarries often, which are quite cold and quite dark. A lot of the diving off the coast is also a little bit colder, a little bit darker. So it is quite adventurous. And I think your comment about the standards being perhaps a little bit higher is 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 pretty valid, actually. I know when I've been overseas and gone and done some um, you know tourist diving and you show them your BSAC credentials, people tend to go, oh, OK, yeah. And they're, they're reasonably confident that you're going to have an idea what you're doing, which hopefully I gave them that impression afterwards as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, for sure. So um, what are some major... You know, obviously you just explained some, but like what are some major differences between a club and an agency? Because I do hear that, you know, there's more clubs, I guess, in Europe as opposed to outside. Or is that is that not a correct statement? To be honest, I'm not really sure if it's if Europe is the more club centric than other parts of the world. The vast majority of my diving has either been in Scotland or on the east coast of Australia. I have dived elsewhere on on the planet, obviously, but um, those are the two sort of main locations. And a club versus an agency, you'll get people, everybody in the club tends to live in the same area. You know, they tend to join the club that's local to them. So they'll, in, in BSAC, as an example, you would join up and you would, you know, meet the other people there. The club's instructors and supervisors would train you in BSAC, have a qualification called Ocean Diver, which is equivalent to Paddy Open Water, essentially. Then from there, you'd go on to Sports Diver, which is the equivalent of Advanced Open Water. And then it, it, it goes on, it goes up from there. But the idea is that it, within the club, you then become one of the dive leaders and then one of the instructors. And then you can bring the next generation of divers on. So it all kind of stays in-house where the club gets to look after itself, which is quite a quite a good way of doing business, I think. Not perfect. There are some certain drawbacks, but overall, I quite liked being part of a um, being part of a, a branch within BSAC when I was diving in the UK. 
Okay. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> Um, and then, uh, my, my next question I wanted to ask is tell me about the diving in Scotland. I've actually, I just spoke to somebody not too long ago. Uh, they do a lot of mine diving in Scotland, but, uh, yeah, tell me about wow. the, the diving. Um, I'm assuming it's going to be cold, but <laughs> I don't know much about it. That's a fair assumption. It is cold and we didn't do much diving in the winter cause it was what you might call stupidly cold. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I think because I lived in North Scotland uh, at a place called Lossiemouth, which is kind of about three and a half hours north of Edinburgh. Most people can kind of get their head around that, I guess. And but I lived on the coast, which was great. And we had our own fleet of, um, of ribs so we could go and do all the dive we wanted to do whenever we wanted to do it. And most of our local dives were all wrecks. So there was um, probably about half a dozen wrecks within not too far away from the coast. There was... Um, uh, we had what well, I, I can't remember the life of, the life of me um, some of the names, but there was a, a fishing trawler down at about 25 meters, which normally would have like you know shoals of fish and conger eels and stuff lurking in, in the nooks and crannies. There was um, a Wellington bomber uh, not too far away in about 17 meters of water that obviously that crashed sometime around World War II, and there was a bit of wreckage on that that was still around. Another wreck called the the Nar, which I think was about 100 years old, um, again, in about 15, 16 meters of water. And that, that was quite funny. There was, there was an old an old rubber boot that somehow had just managed to stand the test of time. So there's all this kind of, you know, iron and steel and things, and then just this boot stuck out <laughs> the side of the wreckage. But yeah, it's relatively cold, but the water's relatively clear most of the time, and perhaps not as clear as it is here in Australia. But yeah, it, it was good. And it was, it was quite adventurous. I, I quite enjoy the adventurous side of diving, where you can actually... You get you you know back roll off the boat. You get to the shot line. There's a bit of current, and you have to you have to put a bit of effort in to get down the line. And then you know that I've I've never quite got over. I really enjoy that that sensation when a, when a wreck appears out of the gloom when you're following the shot line down. I really enjoyed that. So Scotland doesn't, certainly has a lot of that a lot of that to offer. Awesome, awesome. So what was the uh, what was prompting the move from Scotland to Australia to to England? That's a fair question, and it's the answer is relatively simple. It's and with a lot of people, it's it was to do with work. So my <laughs> background is in the British military. I was in the military for twenty, well, the British military for twenty years. I spent three years of it on an exchange posting here in Australia um, it, it, between 2014 and 2017. That's where I met my now wife. So, But once my Australian exchange was over, I had to go back to the UK and I was sent to Scotland. So I went to live in Scotland for those three years. But then once my Royal Air Force career was was over, it was far easier for me to move back to Australia to live with my, my wife, and Amanda, because she's got two um, children. I had no real ties. So I moved back here in 2020, and I've now, I now work for the Australian Air Force. Um, oh. And that's my, full, that's my full-time job, but I'm also, as I say, a, a dive master, do a bit of that um, just casually off the coast here. So a bit of diving, a bit of uh, flying. It keeps me busy <laughs> at the moment, painting a house as well. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, yeah, that sounds like you got a lot going on. Um, so tell, tell me about the diving in Australia where you're at. Is it pretty close to home? I'm assuming just kind of like real close to where, where you live. Yeah, it's good. It is. It's really close. It's really, and the diving here is pretty good. I live about half an hour south of a place called Port Stephens, which is, uh, about two and a half hours north of Sydney for people who don't know Australia very well. And it's a very, um, it's a Port Stephens is an, is a huge, natural um, harbour estuary type place but there is some absolutely fantastic shore diving in there it's probably uh, probably the, the consistently some of the best certainly in terms of accessibility as well the best shore diving in Australia because there's you can there's a site called fly point which is generally the, the best one you can park your car get changed out the back of your car walk down some steps you're in the water after about 10 meters of walking and then you just submerge swim about 20 meters out which gets you about 10 meters of depth and then within the next two minutes you're in this sponge garden with lots of rocks rocky ledges and there's just fish and lobsters and nudibranchs you, you'll get turtles you'll get small sharks and wobbegongs it's it's brilliant and it's because it's a shore dive the weather has to be absolutely awful for it to be ruined so even if it's blowing a gale and you can't go offshore on a boat you can generally get a shore dive in at port stevens it's good it's really good and then you said you're you just uh, you, you moved into rebreather diving. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that? What unit are you on? 
I've got an AP Inspiration, uh, which oh, I okay. which I trained on in the UK. To be honest, I think if I had my time again, I probably wouldn't get the AP, mainly because it's not that well supported in Australia. There, there are people I know that are qualified to service it and, and look after it and things. But if my unit breaks, I, I can't borrow any bits off anybody else because I don't know anybody around here that has one. <laughs> But the, re- the reason I got one, because when I was in the UK working in the in the Royal Air Force, in the UK Armed Forces, they had a fantastic scheme where you could actually go and do what we call adventure training, whether that be diving or, or hill walking or mountaineering or skiing or sailing, all these adventurous activities. You could go and do those as part of your job where they would actually train you in using all this gear and go and yeah just make you a better t- a team member it's a really good sort of scheme to make people better military people um with with the use of outdoor pursuits to have have a good time anyway so the, there was a center in the uk that was focused on diving and they had a uh, a rebreather training um section within it because it's the uk it was relatively ap centric because most people in the uk tend to dive ap rebreathers so that's just what I, that was all I knew really. They, they gave me a unit for free for the week. The course didn't really cost me anything. So I got trained for nothing, which was brilliant because um, <laughs> yeah. obviously it's not, expe- it's not normally cheap to get yeah. trained on a rebreather. And I loved it. I, it was brilliant. I, I think rebreather diving is fantastic. It's quiet. You can stay down for longer. It's, it's, it's a bit of a faff getting the equipment on and off um, and getting it all set up and, cl- and clean afterwards. But once you get into it, it's, it's, it's really, really good. Really enjoy it. So I bought a secondhand AP in the UK um, probably about, yeah, maybe six months before I left the country. Uh, I brought it over to Australia with me and I use it quite a lot. It's brilliant. I really enjoy rebreather diving in this country as well. Yeah, it's great. Cool, cool. Do you, um, so I'm assuming, do you switch back from open circuit to closed circuit or do you try to just mostly do closed circuit? When I'm diving on my own terms, as it were, so just, um, you know, fun diving, if, if it's just me or, well, sorry, if I'm diving with my wife or with, with some of my friends, I'll tend to use the rebreather, mainly because although for a lot of the diving I do is quite shallow and quite accessible and it's, you could easily argue the rebreather is a bit too much faff and hassle. But it's important that you keep using it to keep your skills current because I do want to do a lot more stuff offshore with it. And I would rather when I start doing that a bit more consistently this year, hopefully now I've got my own boat, um, my skills will be such that I can do it competently um, much more quickly. But yes, I do use open circuit when I do my dive mastering. So I, I know I'm going out on uh, on Wednesday, this Wednesday to do a, um, a boat dive up at Broughton Island and I'll be on open circuit there the same as uh, the same as all the people on the boat with me. Okay. Um, so I actually just, uh, did a, my, my first try dive on a couple of units, like a few at the beginning of December. And, Mm -hmm. um, obviously there's, you know, quite a bit of challenge when you first start going into the rebreather. Cause it it took obviously like me, I'm I'm assuming a lot of people took a moment like, okay, I can't use my breath to control my buoyancy. Do you have trouble going back and forth? Or is it just kind of like something that you you can just you fall right back into? Because I I found myself um, at one point I was on the rebreather and I was just kind of you know hovering over a piece of coral or something trying to look. And usually when I'm getting that close, I start to like kind of breathe in to slow myself. And I'm yep. like, this isn't doing anything. <laughs> yeah. So do you, do you find that challenging still to 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 switch back and forth, or is it kind of something you get used to? I think I, I think I would say I get used to it. I'm, I'm not too bad at transferring buoyancy skills between open circuit and closed circuit. What I do find that I'm not very good at on open circuit now actually is uh, is gas consumption. I will because oh. on a rebreather it doesn't really matter. You know you can just breathe as much as you like and it just goes round and round the loop and you, your body just uses as much oxy- as much oxygen as it needs. On open circuit, as you know, it's quite important to be much better with uh, with gas consumption. Um, for all, for all the obvious reasons, and but I find that when I when I go to open circuit, I have to really actually concentrate on um, on my rate of breathing to avoid running out of gas quicker than I would like. So I find it actually harder to go back to open circuit and get the most out of it. I think. Oh wow! Okay, okay. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, uh, challenges that you know. I, obviously, like you hear about it going in, but then when you're actually in the moment doing it, because it's become so natural to me to just breathe to control that fine tuning in the buoyancy so when i hit the rebreather it was like nope this is not this is not in the cards anymore so i I thought that that was kind of a fun thing which i you know obviously have heard a lot of people go through that same sort of thing just because it's a completely different thing than you're learning 
But my uh, my next question, obviously, so how I met you was through, I got your link through Gareth Locke. Um, how did you link up and, you know, get involved with human factors and diving? Okay. So when I was getting more into diving in the UK, back in this, probably going back about five years now, it's probably 29, 2018, 2019. And I can't remember how I came across it as, a, as an, an initial concept, whether it was on Facebook or on a website, but I, I discovered the human diver um, through, through Googling or Facebook. And I just thought this all makes complete sense to me because human factors, regardless of whether it's diving or in my professional background of flying, it's largely the same concepts. You just use different stories, different contexts to bring those concepts to life. So I found that I could just listen to what Gareth was talking about or read what he was writing about and think, this is brilliant. I love all this. I can completely relate to it. I've been using human factors in my professional life as as a pilot for many, many years. So I just thought, this is great. How do I get involved? I wrote to Gareth asked him some questions, some thoughts about some of the things that I was going through with the with my diving, my diving sort of career. And we built up a rapport. I joined the instructional and I joined the instructional team maybe through about three and a half, four years ago now, I think. And um, I've never looked back. I, I, I really enjoy what the human diver is all about and the opportunities it, it can help bring to other people. Yeah, yeah, no. And, and to be honest, I, I can't remember who I was talking to about that but i because i was trying to figure out because it is such a great concept especially to bring that into diving and i was trying to remember like how did i come across it like because i can't i can't Mm. honestly can't remember it but when you do (laughs) finally stumble across it you're like this does make sense this this is very true and i feel like it's not talked about enough or applied enough i should say so no and and obviously i'm i'm very excited because uh, we have the course coming up. Can you tell me a little bit about what is involved in the? So I've taken the the level zero uh, the essentials class. Yeah, the essentials class. There we go. I've taken that online. What is all involved Great. when you go into taking the the first the level one the ten week program? Yeah, sure. Okay, so the level one, as you said, is a ten week program. It's a hour and a half webinar every week for 10 weeks. And we go through each or well, we pick essentially 10 aspects of human factors and how they relate to diving and just go through them in lots of detail one week, um, one week at a time. The beauty of the webinar sessions is it allows people you know, who want to come on board and learn more about it to ask questions, to share stories with me, but also with, with the team. There's no point in just having, you know, being a, a want me, te- me talking to you, Nick. The fact that we've got, I think there's about 12 people signed up already, which is brilliant because the more people involved, the more people have got stories to share, experiences and thoughts to add to the conversation and the more learning you can actually get out of it. So in, a, in, a nine, in, a, in, a, in the 90 minute session, the hour and a half session, uh, I'll probably talk for, let's say, 10 minutes on and we'll go through some slides we'll have some i'll bring i'll talk about some examples to bring the concepts to life and then it'll be a case of right okay group team what are are your thoughts what are your key takeaways from what we just talked about you guys can then add your thoughts you can write them in the chat because it's it's run over zoom or you can you can talk about them over, uh, over over the microphone and we just share some stories some experiences some thoughts and then we go and move on to another topic and do the same thing again. And then we'll generally do that for probably, let's call it an hour, maybe 70 minutes. And then that leaves that leaves about you know 20 minutes, half an hour for sort of more, more detailed question and discussions afterwards. And then between the uh, weekly sessions, there's a bit of homework, which might sound like a bit of a chore. <laughs> but the idea is that you can... During that homework, it's it's all focused on the topic we've just talked about for the, for the uh, during the webinar for the hour and a half, and you can go and think about in your own time a story or an experience that you've had that you can relate to the concepts and then put it down in the community forum within the Human Diver website for other, for me to look at for other people to look at and comment on, so we can all learn from those experiences and take them forward. And the following week, we'll start by recapping some of those experiences uh, and homework that people have done that people have shared and then we'll move on to the next subject and that happens weekly for the 10 weeks the level zero essentials class that you mentioned is very much a case of you looking at some you know recorded material pre-recorded material 
and getting an idea of the concepts, but it's very much a case of this is just a sort of theory and it's, it's a one-way delivery, just you looking at a video in your own time. The beauty of the level one is it's a lot more of you responding to, to me and to your and to the, the other people on the course with your thoughts, your experiences. So there's much more reflection and and detailed learning that can take place. My question with that is, and and I don't, I hope I'm using this term correctly, the just culture term, um, and that's oh, yeah. that's basically so it it it's an environment that allows somebody, or not allows, that's the wrong word to put it, that uh, uh, empowers somebody to speak up, right? Just culture, not is is that kind of correct? Is that a correct assumption, or am I am I off on that? Kind of. So. When you're creating the environment that empowers people to speak up, what you're actually talking about there is having what we call a psychologically safe environment. Now, that's very much related to a just culture. And the idea is, and to put this another way, to have a just culture where people can talk about mistakes that they've had or sorry, mistakes that they've made, things that have gone wrong, and for other people to to listen and, and you know in a, in a in a fair and and just manner, that requires psychological safety to make it happen. So it's kind of related, but the idea is that to have that environment where people feel comfortable speaking up is is what we what we call psychological safety, where people feel able to put their hands up and say, "Hey, this happened to me. I made this mistake," and everybody to say, "You know, thank you for sharing," rather than "Shut up, Mike. You're an idiot. We don't want to hear from you again," because that's not going to exactly create that safe environment for me to speak up. So, yeah, psychological safety is, a, is another way to think about it, and we'll go through this in a lot more detail on the course. Is it's very much a um, proactive thing. So before we go and we, let's say you and I are going to go and do a um, a wreck dive that we've never done before. And we want to have the environment where I want you to be able to say, hey, Mike, um, this, this might sound like a stupid question. First of all, no stupid questions. But, you know, how do I find um, how do I find the bow of the wreck? And instead of me, if I just sort of say, well, what are you stupid, Nick? It's obviously just the pointy bit at the end. That's not any use. So it's important for me to say, well, what we're going to do is go down to the wreck, head north, for example. You'll progress down the side of the wreck and it'll it'll look like this but then you might say yeah a friend of mine or i, I did a, i did a, a dive on a, a wreck similar to this a couple of years ago and this happened we didn't plan our gas very well so that's the case of oh okay well you're now you know actively contributing to the team's success to to help us um achieve our aims and ultimately this, this sort of top level of psychological safety we, we call challenger safety which is where if somebody sees something potentially going quite badly wrong they actually feel able to put their hands up and say, right, stop. Um, we're actually going to potentially have a real serious emergency here unless we do X, Y, Z. So it's a kind of gradual build up process before the dive, during the plan, during the brief, where people feel able to challenge and contribute and talk about lessons that they've got from other dives, creating that psychologically safe environment to allow all that. And then after the dive, once it's done, you reflect on it and you look back on what's happened with a just culture environment. And people can then talk about what happened, what they did well, what they did not so well with that environment where people feel able to talk about those kind of things so that everybody can share those stories and move forward and learn to improve things for the next time. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it does. And you were speaking as an example, like just me and you, right? So usually when mm -hmm. the numbers are a little bit smaller, that fear factor to speak up is a little bit less. What yeah. so when the numbers are bigger, you know, say obviously we're not going in a team of twelve, but like say the 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 class, the ten week program, there's there's twelve people in the program. How what advice could you give either to uh, somebody else not speaking about their experience or somebody speaking about their experience to be like, oh, it's okay, even though there's twelve people here, because I feel like when there's more people, it's a little bit more scary, kind of like you know speaking in front of a big audience, right? Like you, you're the the fear factor is a little bit more. So, what what pieces of advice can you give to make that a better environment or a, a psychologic psych uh, what was it psychologically safe environment? Is that right? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, psychologically safe environment. Yeah, and that's an excellent point, Nick. The, the more people you've got there within the team, within the group, especially if you don't know each other, the harder it is to be that person to put your hand up and say, hey, uh, I've got a thought. Has anybody thought about this? I'm not sure about that, et cetera, et cetera. In answer to your question, though, the best way to do it is for the leaders, the people in positions of authority to 
talk about their own mistakes, things that they've done wrong on a dive. So let's say we're going to go and do um, a hypothetical wreck dive in 30 meters of water uh, in, in quite bad vis, quite poor current. And the last time I did this dive, I got lost on the wreck or I almost ran out of gas or something like that where it got a little bit tricky. And you can pick whatever you want, but it's important as the as the leader, the person briefing the, briefing the dive or running it, you talk to the group about a mistake that you've made and what you learned from it to take forward for future dives. And that way, by setting that example, showing that vulnerability um, that you as the leader who, you know, may may have been put on this pedestal of authority where people think that you've got all the answers and you're brilliant. But if you put your hand up and say, do you know what? I made a mistake diving this wreck last time. This is what I learned from it. Hopefully you guys can learn something too. So if anybody else has got any mistakes to share or sorry, any lessons to share, then feel free to speak up. By doing it as the leader, by setting the example, that empowers other people to do the same. And in my experience in flying, certainly, I've worked with all sorts of of people in in the military aviation world for the last 23 and a half years now. And by far the most credible pilots that I've worked with are the ones who stand up at the front of the room during a debrief after what could be quite a complicated mission and they list the things that they made a mis- they made that they did wrong they list the mistakes that they made and you just think wow you know that guy is an awesome fire pilot but he's just told me all the things he did wrong if he can if he can make those mistakes then I know it's okay for me to make mistakes and talk about them as well so that's it it's, it's, it's by far the most important thing is for the leader to set the example No, no. Awesome. I, I, I love that. And actually I, to be honest, uh, cause I took the, the, the essentials, I think it was probably close to two years ago now. And actually before the class Mm -hmm. starts, my plan is to go through it all again, just so it's like kind of refreshed in my memory going in. Um, and then my, my next question is, so I just finished up the 10 week program. I really enjoyed it. There's actually another level behind or above that, right? Or the next step, do you want to talk about that? That would be the in-person meeting. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the, the level one class, the 10 week webinar that we've talked about that it goes into some pretty detailed theory and allows people to share stories and experiences to try and bring that theory to life in, in quite a lot of depth. You know, there's, there's a lot of sort of time there to cover those subjects. The level two class, the face to face, um, the face to face class that generally takes place over a week, over a weekend. It, it's, it happens. It's just two full days back to back. And that's a little bit different because what it's about is it does have some of the theory, but it's kind of, uh, it's it's largely a kind of refresher of what we've talked about in 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 the, the essentials or the level one class, albeit because you're in a face to face environment, it's a lot easier to have a quick, um, you know, rapid fire discussion when you're sat around a, around a classroom rather than actually rather than over Zoom. The main learning benefit of the level two class is what we call Interlab. So this is a software simulation tool that we have, where it involves teams of between sort of three and, and uh, three and five people, three and six people, and you're flying a spaceship. Now, you might think to yourself, why on earth would I want to do a diving course where I'm flying a spaceship? And that's a reasonable question. But the reason is because if we had some kind of scenario where it would be a case of, okay, guys, this is a diving situation, and I've got Nick, who you know is, is an experienced diver who's now just delving into the world of rebreathers. And then I've got somebody else, let's say Samantha, who's a brand new open water diver, you know, maybe maybe only 10 dives to her name. It would be far more natural for Nick to want to take command, take charge, and Samantha to sort of fall into the background, because that's just the nature of the kind of environment you'd find yourselves in. Most people on this diving class have never flown a spaceship before. So everybody is at ground zero. Everybody starts from scratch, just the same kind of common, the same common ground. But don't worry, you haven't got to sort of be an expert, you know, NASA astronaut candidate, nothing like that. (laughs) The idea is that you're, that the software is deliberately designed such that you have to, as a team, work together and you've got different laptop stations, which act as sort of different cockpits within the space station, but you've only got half the information you need. So you have to get the other bits of information from other parts of your team to make the spaceship, make the mission function. And the idea is that you do these missions that deliberately have traps in them to kind of catch you out and things will go wrong. You use your non-technical skills. So your communication, teamwork, 
you know, leadership is going to be required. How do you enhance each other's situation awareness to prioritize, make the right decisions at the right time to achieve mission success? And we'll do five missions during the scope of the weekend. We will actively and thoroughly debrief each mission looking at what we can take away to improve for the next time. We'll draw parallels from diving. And trust me, there are a lot of parallels you can draw from your diving. And because everybody actually gets fully involved in these missions, the self-reflection during the debrief is so much more thorough that the learning is so much greater as well. Because if I just... If it's just, um, you know, a lot of courses to do with, uh, you know, human factors or, or non-technical skills, a lot of it can just be PowerPoint or, you know, I do all the talking. You might ask a couple of questions, but you don't really get immersed in what's going on. I don't give you any or it's, it's very difficult to give people actual practical exercises where they can put these skills into practice. The beauty of the human factors level two class is that exact. That's exactly what we do. We give you this spaceship and we say, go and fly the spaceship. We, we Don't get me wrong. We teach you how to fly the spaceship first. But you have to use those non-technical skills as a team to achieve mission success. And you look at how you behave individually when you're under pressure. You look at how your team behaves when they're under pressure. What behaviors do you need to address and improve and develop and potentially create from scratch to achieve success? And what parallels can you draw into your diving? It's a, it's a really successful course. And the vast majority of people come away from it thinking that was not what I expected. That was brilliant. Really enjoyed it. And every everybody has, that I've ever certainly trained. Um, and I think the Human Diver as an organization has trained probably about 500 people globally on this class now. The vast majority, all but the odd one or two people, think the course is is brilliant. And it, it, it makes you a better diver. It teaches you how to think about your diving rather than actually your sort of technical skills within it. No, no, I like that. And actually, to be honest, um, I because I know you can go from essentials to the in-person class. You don't need the 10-week program. So I was going to look for it eventually. And then, um, but in the past, so I moved out to Malaysia like uh, it's almost eh, not two years ago, but about a little over a year and a half ago, about, probably about a year and a half. And um, I was, you know, it, it, there there wasn't really much or I couldn't find much out here. So I was actually really happy to get linked up with you to be able to take mm. this next course, the 10 week program. But do you have any in-person classes coming up in 24 or is there anything in this area of the world? Generally, what I will do is engage with people who who want the class to be run. So if we... If you can find, sorry, if you can find, if we can find a group of between four and six people in in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Singapore, you know, the, the Philippines, um, Indonesia, etc., that want to do the class, then I'll come and do the class. It's all part of that's that's all part of the game. That's generally how I worked in Australia so far. Um, I've done a couple of classes over in Perth. Uh, with it with a dive shop over there that I built a relationship with I've done two classes up at Manta Lodge and Stradbrook Island uh, with the team there I'm going, I've already got two more classes booked for the middle of this year as well uh, I'm in consultation with um with uh, a chap in South Australia down in Adelaide I went to Melbourne in November I'm hopefully going back there this year so I, I'm trying to I'm trying to get the message out there as much as I can in in this part of the world in in Australasia and Southeast Asia but really it, it comes down to if people are interested in in the face-to-face class then i will come and provide the training it's it's great fun you'll have it you'll have a great time and i I love delivering it as well so it works it works both ways so australia is a place that i've had a fascination about since i was a little kid probably the crocodile dundee movies sorry hopefully that's not a sacrilegious (laughs) thing to say um but uh no that's the real australia (laughs) um but no it's a place that i've wanted to go so you know if there's uh I'll, i'll have to try to figure out you know when when i and get some dates uh, looked up and figured out, that'd be great to come and take that course. A question, uh, another question I wanted to ask is, so you um, being a dive master, like not necessarily, I guess it's not how you're applying this to the being a dive master, you know, helping out with a course, but if you were going into an open water course, say I was the student going into an open water course, why would it be beneficial for me to take a human factors and diving course? You know, because I'm sure you must get that question a lot. I would assume so. Just people like, oh, what is this? What's all what's all involved? You know, so what like why yeah. would you suggest for someone to because I could see the benefits, obviously, but somebody that might not know as much. And I know you've explained a lot of it throughout this 
uh, conversation, but just kind of like key takeaways from that key takeaways from like why you think it would be a benefit or why you know it would be a benefit i should say there's three kind of um key things that human factors training enable and I, in fact i'll focus on two of them so the first one is is safety human factors or knowledge of human factors and how to apply them and whether that's as a you know a master instructor or a brand new open water student diver if you've got an idea of how humans behave and humans interact with each other with their environment with their equipment then you will be better placed to be a safer diver because you'll be able to think ahead anticipate potential problems communicate better with your team with your team with your fellow students with your instructor ask questions in a perhaps a more appropriate manner to get the information you want and help him help ensure that the team will stay safe so safety is kind of the first one however i am a realist and i know that a lot of people consider safety to be quite boring and do you know what i can see why in its in its pure form safety is not particularly interesting so i get that so what i try and focus on um actually is that if you can again embrace human factors have an understanding of the concepts and think how you can apply them to your diving it will allow you to be a better diver and it will allow you to be a better diver quicker your rate of learning your rate of improvement your the way you can learn skills improve on those skills and move on to you know the next set of skills will accelerate you will be a better diver quicker and actually the third one which is work which is also worth highlighting is humans we like we like getting better quicker. We like working as a team with social animals. These skills, these concepts, these ideas, by bringing them to life, by by getting them involved in your diving, you'll you'll just have more, you will. I promise you, you'll have more fun as a diver as well. So those are the three things. Safety is one. Some people find that a little bit boring. Okay, fine, but that's a big part of what we're about. But you will improve quicker. You will be a better diver quicker. And you will have more fun. Those are the three reasons why anybody should take human factors training, whether you're a, uh, a brand new open water diver just going for, for dive one or you're a master instructor with, you know, two or three thousand dives in your logbook or, or even more. No, I, I love that answer, man. Um, and and like I said, I, I I don't, and I really need to figure out how I came across it. Um, it's probably just word of mouth, or it's out there. But um, no, I really, really did enjoy the class, and and I definitely felt like it, it makes you think, look at things in a different light. So it's, uh, I, yeah. I yeah, and I can completely agree with that. Random question for you because you obviously spend a lot of time underwater and obviously spend a lot of time in the air which is your preference in the air or under the water oh that's a good question <laughs> I, if if i had a choice between one or two it probably it would almost certainly be under the water now because I, I like flying don't get me wrong otherwise i wouldn't do it for a living but i've been doing it for a long time now <laughs> and 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 i don't get to dive anywhere near as much as i get to fly so if i get to if it's a choice of one or the other i'll generally want to go diving because I, I i don't get to do it as much so the novelty value certainly hasn't worn off <laughs> <laughs> just because i'm curious so when you were first joining the military and and i'm assuming you can kind of figure out which route to go was it just like did you know beforehand like i want to fly was that like just did you 100 percent you knew going in yeah my dad was a um a military pilot as well in the royal air force so i, I kind of grew up with it it was something that i'd seen as a, as a young boy growing up going to the air shows going to dad's you know squadrons in we lived in germany when i was a young kid um, and then moved back before we moved back to the uk so i remember seeing all these airplanes and just thinking yeah this is cool i'd like to do this so yeah it was something i'd always wanted to do ever since i was ever since i, I can remember um it was something i'd always wanted to do so it was a, it was a, it was a natural progression for me okay okay can you tell me some similarities is there some some similarities between flying and diving I, I don't know if that's a dumb question or not but it was just just kind of curious no i mean there's, there's as we said earlier there's no such thing as a dumb question <laughs> <laughs> i think the main thing that it's where human factors especially kind of has a, a part to play aeroplane humans were not designed to fly and we also weren't designed to spend lots of time under the water which means that if we want to do those things we rely on you know equipment that's that, that allows us to do those sort of things yes okay there are there are free dive there are free divers that go and do um their sort of free diving thing but that's that's a different sort of subject but if you want to get into flying airplanes or you want to get into scuba diving you have to use equipment and you have to, to know how to get the most out of that equipment requires 
you know, if you like, a human brain to get the most out of it. So, it, it, and one thing I've definitely learned through my uh, my career in, in aeroplanes, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter how sophisticated the aeroplane is, how much money the government has spent buying all these aeroplanes and radars and missiles and stuff. A lot of it comes down to the the man within the machine and how well that person is trained to to deal with the situations they find themselves in. And that's the same for diving. You know, you can have the, the sh- you can have the shiniest rebreather in the world. You can have the most fantastic dive computer with all the functionality you want. But it, if you're if you're not thinking about how to be the best diver you can be, and things start to go wrong, it is very likely that you will fail and you could seriously hurt yourself. And that's exactly the same with that's exactly the same with aeroplanes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, man. Um, so last couple questions before I let you go. Um, you sure. have an open weekend. The boat is fueled up. And where are you going for a diving? What's like a perfect day of diving for you? Where are you going? Oh, what are you going to do? <laughs> well, my, my list of perfect days keeps getting longer. I think so what I do around here, actually, these are the weekends I do actually ponder now. So I would put the boat in at Port Stevens with, um, with my wife, Amanda. And we would go offshore. We'd head up to a place called Seal Rocks, which is probably about 20 nautical miles up the coast. I'd probably arrange to meet a couple of other people there, but they would meet us on the beach. There's no boat ramps there. So I'd just get the boat in towards the beach. People, other divers could come on board the boat. And then there's a couple of wrecks, which I really want to go and explore this year that are down at sort of the 50, 60 meter depth mark. We'd go and do those. Then uh, Amanda, who likes diving but doesn't really like doing the deep stuff, she and I can go and do a dive with the Grey Nurse Sharks around Seal Rocks themselves because that's another one of the Grey Nurse Shark sanctuaries, but it's it's quite far away from most of the other boat ramps, so relatively unspoiled. The sharks don't get much attention. And then we'll drop the other divers off on the beach, and then Amanda and I can go to Broughton Island, which is a nice little archipelago, which is where where the Grey Nurse Sharks live just near, near where we are. But there's plenty of little anchorages there, and we just spend the night relaxing with uh, with a barbecue and a bottle of wine on the on the boat. That's the idea. <laughs> that sounds amazing, man. Yeah, that sounds really fun. All right, and my last question for you is: so, you know, someone that's about to sign up for a course, say, you know, well, I'll, I'll ask for about human diver or human factors of diving. Uh, But, you know, when most people sign up for a course, they're doing like a lot of prep work. They're like, okay, I need to I need to do all of this. Obviously, there's that little bit of work that needs to be done before uh, the first module, I think, for the uh, 10 week course. What advice would you have for someone that just signed up for the course and they want to prep for it? Is it like things that you could do to prep more or is it just kind of just sign up and show up? Like what advice would you have for the person going into the human factors and diving course, the 10 week program, or even the per- in-person class. With any of it, really, it's, I, I would encourage people to come up with, come with an open mind, have some things that you perhaps want answers to some questions based on experiences you've got. You know, you said yourself, if you're in a, or well, you had a question earlier, I'm, I'm in a team of 10 divers and I want to ask a question what sets that team up to be able to enable me to ask that question? Well, that it's best if the leader sets the example. That's the kind of, those are the kind of questions which you get asked all the time. So um, when you're coming on a human factors course, come up with some scenarios that you want answers to. Generally, that's when we do the, um, any class, we'll, we'll say, right, you know, what do you guys want to get out of the program? So that allows me to, to shape the training, to, to give you help, you know, help provide you the answers that you need. In terms of actual preparation, there's nothing. There's nothing required for the ten week class at all. Uh, it is you can come with no human factors knowledge whatsoever. The idea is that we we really do start from the basics, giving people hopefully what I think is all the information they need. But you know, the idea is that I'm I'm there sort of <laughs> forever as a resource. So people have got more questions, more things they want information on, then ask me because that, that's what I'm that's what I'm here for. That's what the human diver is all about: helping people improve their diving. There's no prior training required or um, prior experience required for the level one class at all the only training or sorry prerequisites for the level two class are that you have to have done the essentials and the logic there is that the the theory on the two-day class is covered relatively quickly because most of the of the learning most of the training comes from doing those interlab space missions where you get involved you you practice the skills and then you debrief and reflect on them to learn for next time and if you haven't done the essentials class 
you're going to struggle with some of the basic concepts, the language, the terminology that we use. If you've done the level one class, though, that that's like the essentials class on steroids. So you, you you're already well set up to um to to get the most out of the level two class. Well, Mike, I really, really want to thank you for taking the time out to join the podcast today. Um, I absolutely look forward to the start of the class. And no, I just want to say thank you. It's incredible to hear about your journey. And hopefully, um, is there more painting in store for you or is that all done for the weekend? <laughs> I think it's all done. It's seven. It's seven p.m. now, so I think we're all done for the weekend. But most of my evenings this week are going to be a little bit busy with uh, with uh, with painting. I think until we get this house ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. Once again, man, I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much for coming on to the podcast today. No worries, Nick. Um, all I was going to add, if I may, before we sign off, is if people want to know more about the Level 1 class or want to sign up, feel free to send me uh, an email. It's mike.mason, that's M-I-K-E dot M-A-S-O-N at thehumandiver.com. Off-gassing. A scuba podcast.